Have you ever wondered what non-context-free languages are? Today, we will explore this fascinating topic together. Non-context-free languages in the realm of computer science are a bit of an enigma. They're like the Rubik's Cube of language theory. Complex, intriguing, and a bit tricky to understand. But don't worry, we're going to demystify them today. To grasp what non-context-free languages are, we first need to understand what context-free languages are. Essentially, a context-free language is one that can be generated by a context-free grammar or recognized by a device called a push-down automaton. Picture a context-free grammar as a set of rules that generate strings of symbols. Now imagine a push-down automaton as a machine that reads these strings and verifies whether they follow the rules of the grammar. However, there are some languages that these grammars and machines just can't handle. These are our non-context-free languages. They're like the unruly kids in the school of language theory, refusing to follow the rules set by context-free grammars. They have structures or rules that go beyond the capabilities of these grammars and machines. Take for instance a language that requires the exact same number of three different symbols, or a language consisting of palindromes over a certain alphabet, or even a language made up of well-formed parentheses expressions. These are all examples of non-context-free languages. Why, you might ask, are these considered non-context-free? Well, it's because they often involve some form of counting or matching that cannot be handled by the limited memory of a push-down automaton. They require more powerful formalisms, such as context-sensitive grammars or Turing machines, to describe or recognize them. Intriguing, isn't it? The world of non-context-free languages is a complex maze of rules and structures that our standard tools just can't handle. But that's what makes it so fascinating. So, let's dive in and start with some examples of non-context-free languages. Our first example is a language which consists of strings with an equal number of A's, B's and C's. Picture a language where the number of A's, B's and C's are all equal. It might look something like this. A, B, C, A, B, X or A, B, K. The number of each letter in these strings is the same. But here's the catch. This language is non-context-free. You might be wondering, why is that? Well, let's think about it from the perspective of a context-free grammar, or CFG for short. A CFG can keep track of two different symbols at a time. For instance, it can generate a string containing an equal number of A's and B's like AB or ABI. But when we add a third symbol into the mix, that's when things get tricky. In our language, we're dealing with A's, B's and C's. That's three different symbols, which is one too many for a CFG to handle. You see, a CFG operates using a push-down automaton, or PDA, which has a single stack for memory. This stack can keep track of the number of A's until it starts seeing B's, and then it can keep a count of B's. But when the C's come into play, the PDA can't remember the count of A's anymore. It's like trying to juggle three balls with only two hands. So the PDA would fail to ensure that the number of A's, B's and C's are equal, and thus it cannot recognize or generate this language. This language requires a more powerful mechanism that can simultaneously keep track of three different symbols. In essence, our language of equal numbers of A's, B's and C's is a perfect example of a non-context-free language. It's a language that pushes the boundaries of what a context-free grammar can handle. So you see, this language goes beyond the capabilities of context-free grammars due to the need to track three different symbols. The second example is the language of palindromes over the alphabet. 0, 1. This intriguing language is another prime example of a non-context-free language. Palindromes, as some of you might know, are sequences that read the same backward as forward. This language comprises all palindromes made up of zeros and ones. Now why is this language non-context-free? It all comes down to the unique characteristic of palindromes. Symmetry. A palindrome is perfectly symmetrical around its center. To generate a palindrome, you would need to remember the first half of the sequence to replicate it in reverse for the second half. And herein lies the problem for context-free grammars and their companion, the push-down automaton. They simply lack the memory to do this. A push-down automaton has a stack memory. It's a last-in, first-out system. It can remember the last symbol it read, but it cannot remember the entire first half of a sequence. Let's illustrate this with a simple binary palindrome. 0, 1, 1, 0. A push-down automaton would read the first zero, push it onto the stack, then read the one, and push it onto the stack two. 
Now, it needs to start reading the second half of the palindrome. It pops the one from its stack, which matches the next symbol. All good so far? But then, it needs to match the next symbol, a zero, with the first symbol it read. But that first zero is not on the top of the stack. It's blocked by the last symbol it read, the one. So the pushdown automaton can't access the first zero to check if it matches the last zero. In essence, the palindrome language is beyond the reach of context-free grammars because they lack the necessary memory to keep track of all symbols in a sequence and ensure they match symmetrically around the center. In short, the palindrome language is a great example of a non-context-free language due to its symmetry requirement. Our third example is the dyke language, which consists of well-formed parentheses expressions. The Dyke language is a fascinating study in the realm of non-context-free languages. This language is composed of well-balanced parentheses expressions, where each opening parenthesis is matched by a corresponding closing parenthesis. But there's a catch. No closing parenthesis can occur before its corresponding opening parenthesis. Now this might seem simple on the surface, but when you delve deeper, you find that the task of generating this language isn't as straightforward as it seems. The reason? The need for counting and matching of nested structures, which is beyond the capabilities of context-free grammars. Let's take a closer look. Imagine you're trying to construct a context-free grammar for this language. You'd quickly run into a roadblock when trying to match nested parentheses. You see, a context-free grammar operates with a finite memory, often visualized as a stack in a pushdown automaton. It can handle one level of nesting, but when it comes to multiple levels, it falters. Why is this? Well, with each new level of nesting, the grammar needs to remember the previous levels to ensure that each opening parenthesis is properly closed. But with its limited memory, it quickly loses track, leading to mismatches and ill-formed expressions. This inability to deal with nested structures is what makes the Dyke language non-context-free. And it's not just about counting parentheses. The Dyke language also requires the correct ordering of parentheses, meaning that a closing parenthesis must always follow its corresponding opening parenthesis. This demand for order adds another layer of complexity that a context-free grammar cannot handle. So, we see that the Dyke language, with its need for precise matching and ordering of nested structures, pushes the boundaries of what a context-free grammar can achieve. This makes it an excellent example of a non-context-free language. As you can see, the Dyke language is another prime example of a non-context-free language due to its requirements of nested structures. We have seen three different examples of non-context-free languages today. First, we delved into the language consisting of an equal number of A's, B's and C's. This is a prime example of a non-context-free language, as it defies the constraints of a context-free grammar. The requirement of matching counts of three different symbols is simply too demanding for the limited memory of a pushdown automaton. Then we ventured into the realm of palindromes over the binary alphabet. Despite their seemingly simple structure, these palindromes reveal themselves as non-context-free languages. The need to ensure symmetrical matching of characters around the center surpasses the capabilities of a context-free grammar, as it lacks the finite memory to keep track of the characters. Finally, we explored the Dyke language, the language of well-formed parentheses expressions. This language, too, is non-context-free. It demands the counting and matching of nested structures, a task too complex for the limited memory of a pushdown automaton to handle. Each of these examples has shone light upon the common thread that ties non-context-free languages together. They all involve some form of counting or matching that transcends the capabilities of a context-free grammar and a pushdown automaton. These languages are not bound by the constraints of context-free grammars, challenging our understanding of language structures. However, it's essential to acknowledge that these languages are not anomalies. They are not exceptions to the rule, but rather, they exemplify the complexity and diversity within the realm of formal languages. They demand more powerful mechanisms for their description and recognition, such as context-sensitive grammars or Turing machines. So, as we conclude our exploration today, it's crucial to remember that the landscape of formal languages is vast and varied. It stretches beyond context-free languages, reaching into the realm of non-context-free languages and beyond. Remember, non-context-free languages often require more powerful formalisms, such as context-sensitive grammars or Turing machines, to describe or recognize them. Thanks for joining us today. 
and we hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into non-context-free languages.